I'm joined by Sherman Clark, uh, a law professor here at the University of Michigan who also teaches sport law. And he's going to share with us his insight and perspectives on free speech in sport. Dr. Clark, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you very much for having me. So there's so much conversation and thoughts and perspectives about free speech, what it is, what it is not. What is free speech? Talk about this notion. What is free speech? Give us legally, what is free speech? Define well, it. Let's start with the First Amendment to the Constitution. People often talk about First Amendment rights and free speech rights. And indeed, the Constitution, the First Amendment, does prevent the government from making laws restricting the freedom of the press and of speech. And that's part of what people mean when they talk about free speech. The key legal point, however, is that those constitutional restrictions apply only to the government. So it's only a government entity or what we call a state actor who is subject to the legal constitutional restrictions of the First Amendment. Private actors, businesses, employers, private parties who run stadiums, for example, they are not subject to the constitutional restrictions contained in the First Amendment. Now, that doesn't mean that people are being silly when they talk about the First Amendment rights or free speech rights of people in those other contexts. It does mean, however, that people are using the rhetoric of the First Amendment. They're using it not as, uh, strictly speaking, a legal rule, but a way of capturing what they feel is an important American political mm -hmm. and legal tradition, which is that both inside and outside of the government context, people ought to be able to express themselves and speak freely. So, strictly speaking, the legal rules, at least the constitutional legal rules, only apply to the government or government entities. The concept, however, in the American understanding of free speech mm -hmm. certainly applies more broadly, and that's what people often mean when they talk about free speech. Now, I will say that there are other areas of law that are potentially relevant to people's ability to speak their mind. And we could talk about some of those if you'd like. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're an employee, your relationship with your employer, often negotiated in the form of a collective bargaining agreement, will have a lot more to do with your legal rights to express yourself than background constitutional law. Some states have particular laws protecting employees from certain kinds of speech but those are fairly narrow. They generally apply only to speech done in the workplace and only to certain kinds of speech, and they only exist here and there. Mm -hmm. So in general, the key legal component is the First Amendment. In general, that applies to government entities, not private parties. And most private parties are more likely to be concerned with their employment relationship mm -hmm. than they are with the constitutional law. Mm -hmm. So based on that definition, um, it really seems that you mentioned the lay understanding, the lay interpretation of sport being this venue um, where a right should or should not be protected is really, uh, there seems to be a grave misunderstanding. So I think I know the answer to this question. Um, then why or, or for people who don't think sport is, is, is um, appropriate venue for free rights of athletes and spectators, um, Help, help them to, to further understand the uniqueness of sport. And perhaps it differs from professional sports to collegiate sport. Um, but talk a little bit more about this notion because there's widespread belief that athletes don't have a right to do this in this venue. Well, in some sense, that belief is well-founded. Mm -hmm. In particular, um, when you have private employers like professional sports leagues, their ability to speak out is not controlled by the First Amendment. It's controlled by their relationship. And in the particular example of NFL players, they have a collective bargaining agreement with the league. And in that collective bargaining agreement, they agree that they will behave in ways that do not harm the league. The, the details are not important, but the key is that 
they don't have some absolute legal right to say what they want. And absent some particular protection for which they may have negotiated, they might well be subject to team discipline for speaking up. Now, that's a separate question about whether it's right or even makes sense for a team to try to prevent a player from speaking out or protesting. They have some arguments that they are, that the collective bargain agreement gives them space to do that. And the league has some arguments to suggest that the collective bargaining gives the owners the power to restrict what they say. In that particular context, they're going to sit down at the bargaining table. They're going to sit down at the bargaining table. And when they do, they're going to be negotiating a lot of things now. Mm -hmm. They're going to be concerned about their concussion safety. They're going to be concerned about their, well, they're going to be concerned about their paycheck mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And one of the things they're going to have to think about negotiating is should we uh, uh, negotiate for a broader range of free speech rights? Mm -hmm. Now, in the college context, one key distinction is between public and private colleges. Because as we mentioned, the First Amendment, the constitutional limit, applies to government actors. And that includes public schools. So in fact, in the context of a public college or university, the First Amendment does impose limits on the ability of the school to restrict the speech of athletes. Mm -hmm. Most often that arises in the context, or most often it has arisen, in the context of teams telling players to get off Twitter. <laughs> right. So there's an ongoing argument <laughs> about whether those restrictions are out of bounds constitutionally or as a matter of policy and fairness, of course. Mm -hmm. In the context of public schools, the First Amendment also kicks in. There's a case just at the end of last year, a public high school in California, in which a player, Native American player he happened to be, took a knee during the anthem to protest. Surprisingly, there had been almost no case law about the way in which a public school could respond to that kind of protest. We know that a private school could probably get away with suspending the mm -hmm. kid, and then it's just going to be a question of public relations and common sense and educational policy. But what about a public school subject to the First Amendment? Well, you know, what's interesting is at first they didn't worry about it too much. And what triggered the concern is that opposing players started throwing stuff at the fella, yelling at the fella. Wow. And then, you know, what the school did, the school didn't try to stop the opposing fans from throwing stuff at the fella. They tried to stop the fella from taking a knee. <laughs> And he took that to court. Mm -hmm. And in December, a federal court in California held that he had the constitutional right to take a knee. Now, that's a preliminary. We need to get all the procedures. It's in the form of a temporary restraining order. That's just one federal court. But there are strong indications, and I believe that court got it right, mm -hmm. that at a public university and a public high school, that the players would actually have some legal rights private school is a little bit different, mm -hmm. and they're probably not going to be protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. You know, so what are some of, you mentioned, you know, the, the boundaries. Um, talk a little bit, I want to ask you a two-part question. What are the types of expressions in sport um, are legal, or that athletes have a right to express or demonstrate? I, I think you mentioned you know, in, in the public space, you know, the, the entities cannot restrict their freedom. But there, there are many people who think, yeah, but they can't do this and they shouldn't right. do this. So tell me what's permissible and what's out of bounds. Well, in the context of public actors, there are sharp limits on the ability to restrict, restrict people's speech. So in the context of a public school or a public government facility, uh, the the First Amendment case law sharply limits the ability to restrict people. One of the important exceptions is that you can make reasonable what are called time, place, and manner restrictions, mm -hmm. restrictions designed to protect public safety, mm -hmm. things of that sort. But those are sharply limited. Mm -hmm. Very few limits in the private context. 
we, we should separate here what fans can do when they're yelling mm -hmm. and what players can do when they're trying to make a point. Fans have very few rights to say what they want to say. And part of that is because as part of admission to the event, mm -hmm. you implicitly or sometimes explicitly consent to certain kinds of restrictions. Again, that doesn't mean it's a wise idea to try to shut fans up, mm -hmm. but it does mean that unless you're talking about a, a government-run facility, that even a public but privately run facility can say, yes, you may come to your game, but you can't yell this, and you can't yell racial slurs, mm -hmm. and you can't harass the players. Heck, there are some teams say you can't even wear the opposing side jersey. <laughs> Okay, and that's right. all a part of negotiating. Yeah, that could be a part of safety. You know, if you're in the wrong place with the too, wrong color jersey, right. it could mean that some not so positive I, outcomes. I, I, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a, the question with fans. So we could talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the question about what's what players are entitled to do. Uh, one of the principles in First Amendment law is that that even where regulation is permitted, it's strongly disfavored to regulate that based on content. Mm -hmm. So even if a regulation were permissible on the part of a government entity, it would or not be framed as a regulation on the content of the speech. And as for private individuals, well, that's going to depend on their labor relations and their own policy decisions. So um, it's hard to say, indeed impossible legally to say what exactly players are allowed to say or do. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, or a question is, um, why sports? Mm -hmm. That's the question, or a question. Mm -hmm. Why you got to make your point at the game? Exactly. I mean, many people think that that's not the venue for political and cultural and social activism. That's what people say. What's your thought? I think that they are both right and wrong. Okay. And it's important that they are right and wrong. Because here's, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. They're wrong because they're right. <laughs> now let me explain what I mean by that. Okay. There is a sense in which sports, games, are not the place people want to hear about politics. I understand that. There's a sense in which, why don't you go on your Twitter, write you an op-ed, uh, go do something else. This is the game time. And there's a couple reasons why people feel that's inappropriate. So now I'm telling you why they're right, but I'm about to tell you why they're wrong because they're right. I get mm -hmm. to that. Now, here's why they're right, because I understand. First of all, they're right because people don't turn on the game to hear about politics. You hear about politics all the time. Can't open your Facebook without your uncle throwing some politics up at you, mm -hmm. right? Right. Every place you go, you can turn on the news. Country's falling apart, politics, right? And so people say, I want to turn on the game. I just want to watch the game. It's not where I want to be bothered with this politics. Not that I don't care. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But I, this is not, it's just, you know, Saturday's for the boys, not for politics now. I understand that. So that's part of why they feel like it's inappropriate. But there's, so... And there's another reason on top of that, and both of these are crucial, so just bear with me here. They feel like sports are supposed to bring us together. They feel like sports is the arena that's supposed to unite us. Mm -hmm. We fight all the time, you know, rich, poor, black, white. All the time we got different, uh, and we don't even, some, we live in such a highly segregated society. It's one of our, our great tragedies, I think. and we. We often don't even encounter each other. When we do, we're fighting about something. So sports is a place right there we get together on the field, a black player, a white player, everybody's just playing together, holding hands. You know, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. Do you remember the Titans, Denzel? Yeah. Come on now. Mm -hmm. And on the stands, <laughs> in the stands, that's the one place. Mm -hmm. People go to church on Sunday, segregated, black church, white church. Mm -hmm. People go home, black neighborhood, white neighborhood. Right. But on Sunday or on the game, we're right up there next to each other, cheering on our team or crying over our loss or whatever. That's a bring us together. So both the players, the symbolic, and the fans, actual coming together. And why are we going to take this and slice through this and divide? I understand all that. I absolutely understand all that. So why is it that I say, for that very reason, sports might be the actual appropriate place? 
this is why we had to pause and think, what is it people are trying to do in their protest? Now, look, I've been going too long. You shouldn't have a law professor up in here. <laughs> You're good. If you You're good. Uh, we want this insight. All right, all right, now, all right now. Listen, we, uh, that's why my they... students would award you. Don't get Professor Clark up in there. You run out of film. <laughs> that's why. Listen, that's why our audience look, tuned in to this teacher. All right, that's all right. To get now, your knowledge. All right, bear with me now. Bear with me now, because this is important. <laughs> what do people think they're doing when they protest? Couple different things. One is sometimes you're trying to persuade a particular person of a particular thing. Okay, that's one of the things you might be trying to do. And people say, well, sport's terrible. You're not persuading anybody. They're just there to watch the game, right? So that's part of the argument that sports are inappropriate. But what, what you're sometimes doing when you're protesting is a couple other more subtle things. You're trying to bring something to people's attention. You try to bring something to people's attention that they wouldn't otherwise pay attention to, okay? Mm -hmm. And we don't like to pay attention to things that don't affect us or don't seem like they affect us directly. Social problems affect us all down the road because mm -hmm. what comes around definitely comes right back around. Mm -hmm. And we're all in this boat together, right. whatever metaphor you want, right? <laughs> right. No man's island, bell tolls <laughs> for you, the whole bit. Uh -huh. But it can seem like certain problems don't have anything to do with me, right. okay? <clears throat> and so people, people will pay attention to problems that don't have anything to do with them. And, and, and so one thing that a protest is trying to do is just get you to pay attention to something. Because if I'm a student activist, for example, or athlete activist, see, it's not a selfish thing. They say, well, these millionaire athletes, they're fine. Now, I'm not talking about me. I'm fine. I'm looking out for my brothers and sisters here now. I want you to pay attention to them. So they're trying to draw attention to it. And it's things people don't want to pay attention to. So for that reason, you got to catch them where they're paying attention. Right. You say, look, yeah, I did write the op-ed. Did you read it? I didn't think so. I tweeted this stuff every damn day. Did you, did you, no, you don't follow me on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing it to your attention. Maybe not so you can listen to me. Then they say, well, they don't even know what they want. The athlete said, I might not be sure what I want, okay? But I'm bringing it to your attention. So maybe you'll listen to other people who have input. So if you're gonna bring something to someone's attention, you can't, you gotta do it when they're paying attention. And people don't want to hear about it. So that's the whole point. So that is the point. I know you don't want to hear about it. So I'm going to get you where you got to hear about it. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if it's the only time we come together, the very reason why people don't want to hear, oh, this is the time we come together, right? If it's the only time we come together, that's your only chance. Now, you somebody say, well, don't ruin Thanksgiving. Don't, don't ruin don't ruin maybe an Ed's wedding, bringing up politics. Well, the only time you see your old uncle is, is that Thanksgiving politics, if you want to talk to your uncle, that's when you got to talk to mm -hmm. him, right? So is the opportunity and the fact that people don't want to hear about it is even more mm -hmm. evidence. We want to communicate to people that they, it is, they do have something to do with this. Right. And sometimes also, let me just say this, sometimes a protest is just designed to inconvenience people, so mm -hmm. they're forced to do something about it. Like, you know, I'm gonna block the road, mm -hmm. right? And just, I'm going to annoy you so much until you get ready to do something about this problem. I don't think that's really the main purpose of the sport protest. Mm -hmm. Some protests are like that, like a boycott, you know, blocking roads. That's not the sports boycotts are not about that. They don't interrupt the game. We're going to play the game. I'm fixing to win the game, right? Mm -hmm. I'm right. just telling you that first I want you to be aware of something, that my brothers out here are struggling. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what to do about it. So you don't like to think about it. I don't like to think about it. But I'm going to do something, and it's got to be a little bit bothersome. Prod you to think, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, when you look, we look back at the heroes of the civil rights movement as if everybody was out there cheering them. Mm -hmm. You read the editorials back then. Oh, this is not the right place for King to protest. This mm -hmm. is not the right time. It's never the right time. Because exactly. you got to find the wrong time to make somebody think. Okay, so that's one reason why I say they're right is the mm -hmm. wrong time. But that's why they're wrong, because right. you got to speak up. And there's one more point I want to make, mm -hmm. all right? This is more, a little more subtle. I don't know, more subtle, whatever, like that. But when you're playing sports, you are communicating a message. One might even say you are being used to communicate a message that everything's okay on the unity front. Look, look at all playing together, hand in hand, white mm -hmm. and black. Look at that. See, 
See, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Look at the fans up there, white and black cheering. We're okay. Sports can be seen not just as an opportunity to come together, but as a kind of effort to hide from the fact that we're not really together yet. Mm -hmm. Okay? Could we come together here? That's good. And I cherish that, right? And we should value those opportunities. But the fact is, there's a lot of ways in which there's still a lot of problems. And some people might be tempted to look at sports as kind of proof. Like, see, as proof that we're fine. See, we're fine. We're past all that. Or like the fact that there's black millionaires in sports. People say, see, black people are rich too. Like three of them. Well, come on now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if people are using sports as a way to communicate or tell themselves that we're all okay, then there's a sense in which the athlete is already delivering a political message. All right, when you play the anthem, fly those planes over, do all that stuff, the athlete is already participating in conveying a political message, a social message. They're being not used against their will, but the endeavor is a political communication in a subtle way. It's a social communication in a subtle way. So. If somebody makes you or the job, your job in, intrinsically calls upon you to do things that might be interpreted as if you were saying it's all good, right? Mm -hmm. It's all good on a racial and economic front, right? If you would have to do a job that made it look like that, then you would want to say, I just want to clarify. While I'm, I'm inevitably delivering a political and social message out here. OK, and I'm happy to do it. But let's just clarify what the message is, right? That there is hope that we can work together through sports or an example of that, that we can come together. The fans in this arena are an example of that. But in the meantime, there's still a lot of problems. A kid around the corner got shot. Right. And, and, and that's not going away. Dispar disparity in, in, in wealth and income and opportunity still exists. And that's not gone. Right. And so I think there's a sense in which the very fact that sports are seen as a demonstration of unity and uh, are, uh, are, is itself a reason why that's the arena in which you have to say this is all good, but it's not all good, right? Mm -hmm. And I think another example, let me just say one more example on this. One of our major social problems now, boy, we have enough of them, right? <laughs> all right. Take your pick. But take your pick. <laughs> But one of them is the horrendous treatment of women that we have has been going on and we've been trying to hide from, okay? Mm -hmm. A culture of mistreating women that we see in our so many arenas of life, including law. We find out about judges mm -hmm. acting up. Mm -hmm. We find out not just Hollywood, right? right? Academics, we see it everywhere, okay? And young women and all women have been putting up with this, okay? So part of it, is part of a is part of specific problems at institutions, right? But part of it we we've come to realize is part of a sort of culture that we have, a sort of culture of masculinity, et cetera, like that, right? And I don't, you know, people use that term toxic masculinity as if they're trying to say just being a man is a problem. No, it's talk about a set of attitudes that are problematic. Now look, this is not, you know, social studies one oh one. I don't even understand all that stuff that well. But I'm trying to come to understand it. Mm -hmm. Men of my generation are being forced to wake up and try to understand the problematic underside of some of the practices that we saw as just normal, ordinary, fine, right? We think, well, I never acted like that. I never grabbed up on anybody, so I'm fine. No, no, no. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. And part of that is our sports culture. Our sports culture has played a role in crafting the larger culture around masculinity, around power, and around the treatment of women indirectly. So I would think that athletes would have not only a right, but even a special obligation to speak up on those issues. So if I see athletes trying to find a way to bring to our attention the fact that we're not all good on matters of race and inequality, we're not all good on the treatment of women, and I'm going to interrupt you, not going to ruin your game, but I'm going to take my moment here, and I'm going to make you think about something you don't want to think about. 
because I indirectly have been complicit or part of the culture in which this has been nurtured, and I want to take that opportunity. So I feel like for those reasons, sports are both the, absolutely the wrong, but but just the right place mm -hmm. to speak up. So I have great respect for the athletes that speak up, even if I disagree with them, because mm -hmm. I don't always agree with them. And sometimes mm -hmm. they don't even know what they want. <laughs> they're all one, say one thing and another, they're all confused, they don't mm -hmm. know what they're protesting, mm -hmm. but they're angry. They're speaking up for their brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and they're calling it to our attention. Mm -hmm. You know, I can see it perfectly sensible mm -hmm. for a young man, young woman, a student, to say, look, I'm 20 years old, I don't know. I don't know how to solve this problem. Y'all supposed to be running things. I'm just telling you that our generation is here to say it's not okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to ignore it, okay? Don't put it on me to come up with a solution to police violence, poverty, or the mistreatment of women. I, I have some thoughts. You want my thoughts? I'll give them to you. But the fact that I haven't got to figure it out, that's not going to stop me from speaking up because I'm putting the heat on you. You people that call yourself professor or senator or whoever you call yourself supposed to be leading us. I'm going to get your attention the only way I can and make you think about it. Right. <clears throat> Very engaging and insightful response. Um, I really appreciate that because I, I agree with you. I think sport does uh, perform both of those roles. Um, even when people don't want to see politics, sport is inherently political. It's inherently social. It's inherently cultural. Now, you've talked about, you know, athletes and the role, the rights they should have, the freedoms that should not be restricted. And we see this the struggle for power uh, with athletes still trying to express their rights. And yet we see organizations saying, but yeah, but you, you can't do that. So my question to you is to help us distinguish between athletes, what people consider personal expressions in sport yeah, yeah. and their political expressions in sport. Yeah, I think to the extent that there's a legal distinction, mm -hmm. the courts have always placed special concern for people's right to express themselves in the context of politics. So one might say that their rights to express themselves politically are um, even more important. However, I would say that it's troubling, not troubling, that's too strong. I don't want to draw a sharp line between personal and political. And here's what I mean. Mm -hmm. People say, I don't want to talk about politics. And it's not clear exactly what they mean by politics, right? Because politics is not a some separate thing. And then life and the things you care about as a human being are some other thing. Politics is the vehicle through which we as citizens and neighbors, it's one of the vehicles. It's not the only vehicle, and that's important. Sometimes it's not the best vehicle, but it's a vehicle through which we try to come together and figure out how to live together and address the problems that we face, right? So, so if some kids get shot, we say don't politicize it. We say it's political, right? Politics is the place we work together to solve problems. Okay, so you say don't come together to try to solve problems. No, and politics is one of the ways that we do that. So, so I want to suggest that the personal and the political can't be divided in such a sharp way. If somebody's trying to express their rights over gender identity or race, inequality, these are things that are personal to them, if, especially if they affect them directly. But even if they don't, if I see my brothers and sisters being mistreated or not being respected, and it, it, you say, well, that's... Is that personal? Is that political? As a human being, I think that's wrong. And I realize that our political institutions are one of the places we address that. So I, I would suggest that those are closely related. And, I, and, and I'd also say that there's a little bit the sense that you could say, I don't want to talk about politics is, you know, we use this word all the time, privilege. People throw around this word privilege. And the minute you talk about privilege, somebody wants to roll their eyes because <laughs> no one feels privileged. Right? And it's certainly true that everybody has their struggles. So if what people think we mean when we say, well, you're displaying privilege, is like we're accusing them of being spoiled or rich or not having any real problem. I don't mean that a bit. What I mean when I talk about privilege is the ability not to worry about certain kinds of things. 
all right? So, like, you get in the right situation, and there's a lot of stuff you don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. So if you're relatively comfortable financially, you're relatively secure in your job, you don't have any immigration issues, your gender identity happens to fall right into some standard category everybody's comfortable with, et cetera, et cetera, then you have the sort of privilege to say, well, I don't want to talk about politics. Don't bother me on my Facebook with politics. I just want to talk about my grandbabies. Or I just mm -hmm. want to talk about my, you know, whatever like that. Mm -hmm. And that yet somebody who's trying to figure out whether they're going to get deported, okay, whether they're going to get harassed as they try to work through their own issues, whether they're going to be discriminated against, lose their job, et cetera, et cetera, they're trying to communicate that, and you're trying to dismiss That's politics. I don't want to talk about that. So there's a sense in which people want to carve a line and say, leave politics mm -hmm. out of it. You know, it's in it. You just don't recognize it's mm -hmm. in it because it's already worked to insulate you from it. So I would say that when it, when it comes to anybody's right to express themselves, I wouldn't ask them to draw a line and say, here's for the personal and here's for the political, mm -hmm. especially with young people. I would encourage them to say, Think deeply, speak your mind with respect and openness, and that's going to, if you're thoughtful, then the problems that you care about as a human being and the ways in which you try to address that, some of which might be politics, some of which might be through your church or through your community association, or through, those are all going to be intertwined in that way. So in that sense, I think we should be encouraging young people to speak up. And you know what? They're going to be silly sometimes, <laughs> all right? You got young people who express themselves are going to be ridiculous mm -hmm. sometimes. They're going to have crazy haircuts and crazy tattoos, and they're going to speak up before they really know what they're talking about all the time, right? I get that. That's okay. They're young people. I encourage them to speak up, and our job, our job is to listen. Right, right. right. And if they don't get it exactly right every time, let's help them work it out. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to them, help them work it out. Right. I want to say, wait, you, I keep going on and on, but here's something that's particularly relevant in the educational context. Mm -hmm. This may be a little less relevant with professional athletes, they're growing, whatever, like that. That You might want to view that more as a business relationship, right? But, but college, we're supposed to be helping these young people educate themselves. So if we create a situation where we tell them, shut up and play, whether we say it directly or indirectly, we are not only restricting their rights as people. We're betraying what we owe them. People are talking about, should college athletes get paid? I don't know if they should get paid or not, but they should get educated. <laughs> That's what we owe them. And part of that is to encourage them to speak up and to help them express themselves more clearly if they don't do it so clearly, to help them do it more thoughtfully if they don't do it so thoughtfully. So in general, even if the law lets us get away with it, which it often does, I don't think it's a great idea to try to tell young people, don't talk about that, don't speak about that, don't go on social media, don't like that. Let's try to help them express themselves, and then let's have a little understanding if they mess up once in a while, right, if they don't get it exactly right. Right. Let me. I have a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try um, to no, answer your questions you're, more you're good. concisely. You, you, no, you're, <laughs> you're doing wonderfully. You're doing wonderfully. <laughs> so when you talk about this notion of, athletes and their rights and this consciousness that's making people try to find ways of being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Is there a difference between their on the field rights and their off the field rights? I think so. I think so. I think that, again, we use the term rights and what we're really talking about is how we think about how we ought to regulate their behavior. Because as mm -hmm. you said a number of times, um, the, ter the, the absolute legal rights are, are um, uh, somewhat limited, except for in the context of public government actors, mm -hmm. state actors. Um, but um, I think it is appropriate, and to the extent that the law is relevant, the law recognizes that it is sometimes appropriate to think about the right time and place. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it would not at all be pr uh, unfair or unreasonable for a school to say, no, well, you can't stop in the middle of the play, you know, hike, hike, go out for the pass. Wait, stop. Before I throw this ball, I'd like to make a speech mm -hmm. about social justice. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, we're, we're, we're going to cut you off the team now. We can't play you on the team if you go stop the play mm -hmm. to make a speech, right? Mm -hmm. 
because it, it is appropriate within the context of the game, you know, mm -hmm. to say we got to do the thing. You got to play the game, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be the distinction. And, you know, not that I, look, if a player decided to make a more radical act of protest during the game, I don't know exactly what I think about that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's certainly sensible for school to respond differently. Right to look this is the playing of the sport and in order for us to have this activity which by the way then provides you the forum to take a knee to an anthem or whatever else you want to do right mm -hmm. then we all had to agree that well, like once the whistle goes we're gonna play the game right, right? right. um and uh and i think that kind mm -hmm. of restriction makes sense mm -hmm. but but that's more restriction between are you uh, behaving in a way that's inconsistent with the maintenance of the very activity mm -hmm. that provides you the forum. Right. It's not so much on-field, off-field okay. difference. So one of the questions, uh, as, I, as we wind up this session, one thing I want to talk about, you know, much of this debate, the reason that there's so much conversation about free speech and sport is because it, 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 it was visibilized during the, the national anthem. Yeah, yeah. Then it seems as though the mere expectation for student athletes, for fans, for administrators, the expectation of the norm for them to stand during the anthem, isn't that somewhat inherently restrictive? Or yes, not? it is. It's not only is it something somewhat restrictive, it's not universal. It hasn't always been universal. And more to the point, it's an emphatically expressive act. Right? So to say that you there's no place for political expression but here's what we're going to do. We're going to be mandated to perform this act of political exactly. expression. <laughs> okay, so one of the great, one of the old constitutional law cases on free speech is in a public school, but it's salient is that they can't sus suspend a kid who, for religious reasons, doesn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance, mm -hmm. right? So, so it is a little mm -hmm. bit of irony there that mm -hmm. it's a manifestly uh, mm -hmm. political act and that it's an um, expressive act that's being mandated and then you say, well, don't use this occasion to, to make any form of expression. But let me, yeah. let me just follow up one more thing, okay, okay before you run out of film here. <laughs> the, the anthem protests, and I use that word, it's probably the wrong way to describe it, but, but describing it that way actually captures my point. The um, message that was that the players were trying to deliver when they took a knee. I'm not saying they were uniform or even all of them knew exactly what they were trying to mm -hmm. say. But the way in which that message was translated and was interpreted by some people, is interpreted by some people, whether legitimately or disingenuously, is as though they were protesting the anthem or protesting, even worse, the troops. And the place, well, 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 that's not what we're doing with the protest. The anthem, we love the anthem. I mean, it's hard to sing, but we love the anthem. <laughs> and the troops, we love the troops. Okay, we're not protesting. We're, we're using the occasion of the anthem uh, to um, communicate something. And what's with the troops? When does the anthem and the troops, right? You want to respect the troops. Like, let's provide some housing for the veterans, right? Let's, let's clean up the VA, right? <laughs> when did standing up for the anthem become a proxy for respect the troops. So there's a sense in which there's a, 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 not a single lesson, but a broader kind of warning that when you express yourself, you got to try to figure out how, if you can, to not have your message co-opted. And when we listen to people, We've got to try to understand what they really are trying to say rather than just put a meaning on it for them. So the obligation is on both sides, right? When people speak up, it makes sense to think, well, how's this going to be interpreted? And they can't always do that, right? Because as we already said, part of the point is to make people uncomfortable. But at least you want to be understood. And then we've got to be cautious against and on guard against the intentional or even inadvertent mistranslation of a message. You know, take a knee is in many contexts a paradigmatic sign of respect. You know, when I see, um, when I see this protest taking a knee during the anthem, if I wanted to deliver this message, 
if I wanted to say to the country, I love you, I respect you, you can do better. If that's what I wanted to say to the country, I can't think of a clearer way to communicate that than silently, respectfully, take a knee. Yet that very message was communicated like, I hate the country, hate the troops, mm -hmm. right? To me, that message, so I don't know how to put this on the young players. I can't even figure out a better way to say that because right. that's what I hear many of them saying. Right. I hear many of them saying to the country, I, I, I love you, right? I respect you. We could do better, right? And I can't think of a better way. So maybe in this particular case, rather than tell them they need to figure out how to clarify their message, we need to tell ourselves and others uh, be quiet for a minute and listen to what they're really trying to say. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Speaking of which, I'm going to use that as your call to action um, to, to help people to understand, to listen. Um, but as I say that, I, I still want to give you a chance to offer any concluding remarks you have to the millions of people who've tuned in to, to learn more you know, about this debate with free speech in sport. Any concluding remark you'd like to share? You know, the only thing I'd say is the same thing I just said, right? When you see young people trying to come to terms with a difficult issue and make a point, rather than just put them into some box that makes us comfortable, understand the instinct to do that. We don't want to think about things that bother us. And sometimes young people don't really know what they're talking about that much, and they don't say it so clearly. But instead of just putting them in some kind of box and figuring out how we can shut them up, or even talk about what their rights are or what their rights aren't. Why don't those of us, especially those of us from our generation, right? Why don't we see if we can step back and not only understand what they're trying to say, but help them say it, and then listen. That, that would be what I would say. Outstanding. I, I hope you have enjoyed this engaging, enlightening session as much as I have. You've given us so much knowledge relative to understanding the dynamics and the nuances of, of free speech, how it's contoured and, and what's permissible and what's not and how we've interpreted. Um, thank you so much, Professor Sherman Clark, law professor here at the University of Michigan who also teaches sport law. And I'm sure he just is a wealth of information in a lot of different areas. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yes. All right.